Dear Lord, thank you, God, for everyone that's here tonight. Pray that you would touch our hearts, that you would remove anything from us that's, that would keep us from hearing your word tonight. Pray that, uh, that I would just be the mouthpiece, Lord, that this would be um, your word, Lord, that you would receive the glory for everything taking place, God. In Jesus' name, amen. So last Thursday night, we were in chapter 17 of the book of Matthew. And we were talking about the transfiguration of Jesus on what was probably Mount Hermon in the region of Caesarea Philippi. We talked about how Moses represents the law and Elijah represents the prophets and how Jesus fulfills both the law and the prophecies. We read about how the Shekinah glory of God appeared in the form of a cloud over Jesus and declared him as God's beloved son to Peter, James, and John, only three of the disciples. Lastly, we read about the other nine and their failure to cast out the demon-possessed boy and how if you have the faith, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can accomplish anything if it's within God's will. Even telling a mountain to get lost. The point of this wasn't for us to walk around rearranging the terrain or to make landscaping easier, but rather to say that nothing is impossible with God and nothing can stand in God's way. So we pick it up in verse 22 of chapter 17, where Jesus again predicts his death and resurrection. Now, while they were staying in Galilee, Jesus said to them, the son of man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men and they will kill him. And the third day he will be raised up and they were exceedingly sorrowful. So the transfiguration, which took place on Mount Hermon, that's where they were not long ago. Now they're in Galilee, which is about 44 miles south of the mountain. Galilee is not actually a city, but a region, an entire region in, the northern, in northern Israel, and is bound by the mountains of Lebanon in the north. It extends all the way down to the Jezreel Valley in the south, reaching eastward towards the Golan Heights, the Sea of Galilee, and the Jordan River, and all the way to the coastal mountain range along the Mediterranean Sea to the west. It's a fairly large area to consider. And Jesus and his disciples were previously in the region of Caesarea Philippi when the transfiguration took place. Now they're in Galilee. Therefore, Jesus and the 12 disciples had been on the road traveling, but we do not know how long or how long it took them to get there. We do not know if this is the next day. And Jesus again tells his disciples that he will be betrayed and killed. This is not the first time Jesus has told them this, nor will it be the last time. And we see their reaction for they were exceedingly sorrowful. These two words give us an idea of how they felt and that the word exceedingly in the Greek is sphadra, which means greatly or vehemently. And the word sorrowful, which is lupeo, means to cause grief or to throw into sorrow. To throw sounds like a pretty violent term to me. And all this to say that the disciples were violently grieved to hear Jesus talk of himself dying. You might ask yourself, why? Well, good question. The disciples were so depressed that their faith was yet again diminished. Jesus is now on his way to the cross. These are his final days. He's in Galilee right now, but soon he will be journeying towards Jerusalem, where he will be crucified. 
Even though Jesus told them over and over that he would die and be raised again, they were so struck by the, or stuck on the part of his death that they didn't pay attention to the part about his resurrection. It's like by the time Jesus said, they're going to kill me, that something went off in their brain and they started to panic. They totally missed out the part about the resurrection. Their mind blinked. It wasn't until after Jesus' resurrection when they remembered, well, yeah, he said he was going to rise again. You know, woohoo, all right. It's interesting how sometimes we hear some bad news and our minds just kind of blank out in shock. And we don't remember the rest of the story. Well, whenever Jesus would talk about his death, it was so shocking to the disciples because they thought he was going to set up shop. They thought he was going to bring down the Roman Empire to free the Jewish people and to set up his own kingdom. And they wanted a part in this kingdom. But they thought it was a physical, earthly kingdom that Jesus was going to be setting up. And they thought that they that what awaited them was a position of authority in this new government. You know, one of the greatest causes of frustration in people's lives is unmet expectations. It can, be, it can quite easily cause us to lose our perspective and our joy. And thus they were so upset that they didn't pick up on him saying, but on the third day, I'm going to rise again. It's also interesting and kind of sad that on the third day, none of them were looking for his resurrection, nor did they believe the first several accounts of his resurrection. In Mark chapter 16, starting in verse 9, we read, Now when he arose, when he rose early on the first day of the week, he he being Jesus appeared to appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him, as they mourned and wept. And when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe. Continuing in verse 12, after that, he appeared in another form to two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they, were, and they went and told it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. Verse 14, Later he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table, and he rebuked their unbelief and their hardness of heart, because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. Of course, let's not forget our friend Doubting Thomas. He gets a bad rap. But when told by the other disciples of Jesus' resurrection and appearance to them in John chapter 20, verse 25, Thomas said, Unless I see his hands, the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. It's truly amazing just how patient God is with us in our unbelief and our rebellion against him. Back to chapter 17 of of Matthew. Peter and his master pay taxes. Coming up on tax time. So verse 24, when they had come to Capernaum, those who received the temple tax came to Peter and said, does your teacher not pay the temple tax? He, being Peter, said, yes. And when he had come into the house, Jesus anticipated him, saying, What do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth take customs or taxes? From their sons or from strangers? Peter said to him, From strangers. And Jesus replied, Then the sons are free. So let's take it back up to verse 24. 
When they had come to Capernaum, those who received the tax came to Peter and said, Does your teacher not pay the temple tax? To which Peter responded, Yes. Jesus and his disciples, now in Capernaum, a city along the north, northwestern edge of the Sea of Galilee, and those who received the temple tax, which would be the priest, the temple priest, came out to Peter, not to Jesus. They came out to Peter. Now, if you remember, as we've been going along in the book of Acts on Sundays, the Sadducees were the ones who served in the temple. And this was partly because they believed that God's presence could only be found in the temple. The Pharisees served in the synagogues and focused more on studying the law. So it was the Sadducees that had come out to Peter in kind of an ensnaring way, asking him, does your teacher not pay the temple tax? I get this feeling of peer pressure when I read that. Now, the temple tax was a half shekel and was originally collected during the construction of the first temple, specifically for the sanctuary in Exodus, where we read in chapter 38, verse 25, and the silver from those who were numbered of the congregation was 100 talents and 1,775 shekels, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, a becca for each man, that is, half a shekel, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, for everyone included in the numbering from 20 years old and above, for 603,550 men. So the shekel was a religious payment, one as unto the Lord, and used for the construction of the temple when the people were counted. But now this temple tax had simply become a custom as it was not a tax levied annually. It had developed into a tradition whereby those who were considered religious would pay every year, but it was a voluntary annual gift. It was optional. To borrow a quote from Spurgeon's commentary on the book of Matthew, quote, such religionists as these would be as these, would be very particular not only to pay the annual tribute, but to have it known that they paid it. End quote. They wanted to be seen doing their good deeds. It was all about the attention. What a shame. They wanted this, this had turned into a game of religiosity, whereby men measure their spiritual com- their spirituality in comparison to others by whether or not they pay the temple tax. Oh, look at me, look at me. I can hear them cry. I'm so spiritual because I go above and beyond what is required by law, and I even pressure others into doing so, causing a head trip for them, and thus making money for the Lord's temple. Not only does God not need our money, Whatever tidbit of attention and praise they received for this tax was the only reward that they were going to get for it. And so now the temple priests had made their attempt to pressure Jesus by cornering Peter into pledging to pay the tax. And how quick Peter is to give an answer. He immediately responds with a yes. The audacity of Peter to think that he can give an answer for Jesus or on his behalf. Yes, perhaps Peter was just trying to protect Jesus' reputation. However, he was in such a hurry to vindicate Jesus that instead he compromised him. Peter could have referred the priests and their question over to Jesus. Or at least they could have asked him, what, what he planned to do, or at least Peter could have asked Jesus what he planned to do concerning the temple tax, but rather Peter just speaks for him. Peter had been outside when, the, when he answered the temple priests, and likely, let me find my spot here, Yeah. 
and likely did not consider that Jesus would pay attention to his conversation with the priests. But as soon as Peter walks through the door, he's confronted by Jesus. We can't get away with anything when it comes to God. He sees it all. Continuing in verse 25, And when he had come into the house, Jesus anticipated him, saying, What do you think, Simon? From who do the kings of the earth take customs or taxes? From their sons or from strangers? Jesus knows everything, just as God the Father knows everything. I love how Jesus doesn't give Peter any time to come up with a defense. It says Jesus anticipated him. This word is the Greek word prophano, which actually means to prevent. Jesus prevented Peter from speaking first, whether by his power or just getting speaking first before Peter can say anything. That we don't know, but he prevented Peter from speaking nonetheless. Then Jesus asks him kind of a leading question here. And since he's God, he can do that. There is a desired answer that Jesus is prompting from Peter. And of course, there is a feeling that this is also a rhetorical question. One that should be self-evident, known plainly, or just common sense. It should be plain to Peter, since he has already confessed Jesus as the Son of God and his Savior, that Jesus should not have to pay the temple tax. Yet in the moment, it can be quite easy to cave and give in to pressure when you're not prepared for it. Peter's response in verse 26 was, from strangers. And Jesus said to him, then the sons are free. First off, Jesus doesn't refer to him as Peter, but rather as Simon. I think this is significant and another display of God's love for his people and that he knows exactly who we are inside. He knows our faults. He knows our weaknesses. Before Simon walked with Jesus, he was an impulsive, insecure, and unreliable man who liked to run his mouth so much he'd often run his foot right into it. I don't imagine any of us can relate to that, though. But that was who his old self was before he knew Jesus. The name Simon means a hearing or to hear, which is humorous when you consider just how quick to speak and slow to hear Peter was. When Jesus called Simon to be a disciple, Jesus gave him another name, the name of Peter or Petros, in the Greek meaning a rock or a stone. Cephas, another name by which Peter was called, is simply the Aramaic word for the same term, rock or stone. It is interesting to note that the name Simon kind of symbolizes the godless man who lives according to the flesh the man before Jesus. Peter represents the changed man who walked not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit, the man who walked with God. Perhaps the reason Jesus referred to him as Simon in this instance was to remind him of his sin nature as a way to, for Simon to check himself, to have a healthy look at his own heart, at his motives, and remember the old man he was and the new man Jesus was helping him to become. Peel back the onion skins and examine yourself, as Bob would say. Whether it is of God or of the flesh. I love how gentle Jesus is with Peter in correcting him and getting him back on track. So Jesus asks him, who do kings collect tax money from, family or strangers? And Peter replies, from strangers, and rightly so. Jesus replies that family must not then be required to pay the king's tax. Jesus is making an analogy here that Peter should have recognized. 
Because Jesus is the Son of God, or is God the Son, he is therefore exempt from God the Father's, the King's, tax. But Jesus goes on saying in verse 27, Nevertheless, lest we offend them, go to the sea, cast in a hook, and take the fish that comes up first. And when you have opened its mouth, you will find a piece of money. Take that and give it to them for me and you. There are several super interesting things about this miracle with the half shekel. Firstly, it is, the only, it is only recorded in the book of Matthew. The Gospel of Matthew has been nicknamed by some Bible scholars as the Gospel of the King. Jesus being free from having to pay the tribute affirms his kingship, his royal blood. Secondly, it is the only miracle that he, being Jesus, performed to meet his own needs. The miracle was a means of maintaining Jesus' reputation and preventing any hindering of his ministry, which Peter risked compromising when he answered the Sadducees speaking on Jesus' behalf. Thirdly, it is the only miracle using money. With Matthew's profession being that of a tax collector, I have to smile that he was the one chosen to write this book and to be the only one to include the miracle in it. Perhaps this was God's way of blessing and encouraging Matthew, speaking to him on a level that Matthew would really relate to. God speaks to each of us where we're at and on our own level. Fourth, it is the only miracle using a single fish, unless, of course, you consider the prophet Jonah in the belly of the whale or the big fish. But we're talking about the little guys that Peter would often have fished for as his means of making a living. It was also a miracle specifically performed for Peter. This miracle was also performed in part so as not to make a liar out of Peter or to cause a dispute between Peter and the temple priests. It allowed Peter to keep his word, though he shouldn't have said anything in the beginning. Another thing we see Jesus doing here is that he's not willing to give any ground for offense or for offense. This is something that goes deep and could be a study all on its own. But basically, we ought to follow Jesus' example in bending over backwards so as to avoid offending or stumbling someone and possibly preventing them from coming face to face with their Savior. There are many of many of examples of what this might look like. And while we know that we are free under the new covenant, we must be careful in that freedom, in that freedom so that we do not do something that would hinder someone else from accepting the very Savior we should always be trying to emulate. Now, in the world today, it is very easy to offend someone. We are a thin-skinned people. But what this is referring to is about offending someone on the basis of affecting their decision for salvation. Anything that would turn them away from the Lord. Sixth, it is the only miracle which does not have the results recorded. But we know that Jesus always keeps his promises, and thus we can be assured that when Peter cast in his hook, there really was a fish waiting around to cough up the moolah. How amazing that is that God divinely planned out a fish swallowing the precise amount of money needed to pay the tax and to be the first fish to get caught when Peter began fishing. Oh, and speaking of Peter... I love how Jesus gets down to Peter's level in the way Jesus vindicates Peter's foot-and-mouth dilemma. What was Peter's occupation before he was called to be a disciple of Jesus? Oh yeah, that's right. He was a fisherman. It's as if Jesus is saying, you know what, Peter? Not only do I forgive your quick tongue 
and not only will I fix this problem for you that you got us into, why don't we mix a little business with pleasure? Shall we? Let's go fishing. Cast your hook in, and when you catch a fish, pull it up, and inside its mouth you will find enough money to pay for the both of us. I just think that's great. Lastly, we do not know exactly whether the coin was a whole shekel that quite literally paid for Jesus and for Peter as well. One thing to note here is that the temple priests did not ask Peter if he made a habit of paying the temple tax, but rather they only asked if Jesus paid it. They were trying to ensnare him. Or perhaps the aspect of the coin paying for both Jesus and Peter refers symbolically and that it vindicated Peter, allowing him to keep his word and maintaining Jesus' reputation as well. Or perhaps it was more prophetic and symbolic, and that Jesus would soon go to the cross to pay the price for Peter's sin and the sin of the whole world. It's not clear, however, it is exciting to think about. God always has a plan, and he is always working behind the scenes in ways deeper than our minds can fathom. Let's pray. Dear Lord, once again, thank you for bringing us all out here this evening. I pray, God, that you would go before uh, the Valentine's dinner coming up and for Sunday, Lord, that you would be glorified in everything we do and that you would just keep us all safe going home this evening. In Jesus' name, amen.